theme today, Ashwin, is art of a bestseller. So let's begin that as our first question. Is there a secret ingredient to write a best-selling book? You get a book out every two years. He's been writing from 2007. It's now 2022. You write a book every two years. It flies off the shelf. People wait for your next book. Bharat series is so popular. There is a very simple, simple three-point formula for those who are wannabe writers in this crowd. Can, am I audible? Yeah? Okay, lovely. So there is a simple three-point formula. The first part of it is that your opening paragraph should be like a pothole. A pothole of Bombay or Delhi where you fall in and it's impossible to get out. So if you get then you are sucked into that story. That first paragraph should do the job of the pothole. The second is that I like to keep my chapters short hmm. and every chapter, the most important part of that chapter is the last line because that last line will determine whether your reader goes to the next chapter or not. The most difficult quality of a writer is to get someone to turn the page. And that is what that last line of the chapter does. And third, mm. is that your last paragraph should be like a satisfying burp at the end of a meal. It should make your reader feel that you've tied up all the loose ends, mm. that you've given him a satisfying conclusion. Mm. But most importantly, it should get your reader to look out for your next book okay. so that you can continue to be a bestseller. So it's a three-point formula, not very I difficult. I think you're saying it very easily. I think these are great tips, but I also realize that you're saying it very easily. Apologies. But it's also about the content eventually that you put in. Let's talk about the content. Sure. Then. Religion, science, a mix of both. How easy or difficult is it? And why did you think that I don't want to just write on either? I want to mix it. I want to have Christianity and perhaps the quantum part of it. I want to write Buddhism and have science in it. Why did you write and how difficult is it? What if someone's offended? What, what if someone says that's a distortion? Because yeah. how dare you write a fiction on our religion? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, let me just sort of correct the impression here. I am not interested particularly in, let us say, religious theology hmm. or in mythology or in science or in philosophy. My, I consider myself, if you had to define me, yes. I am defined as the overlap guy. I am always interested where there is an overlap. So, for example, uh, uh, if I, let's say... Uh, look at uh, our dharmic philosophy hmm. and we of course have the creative force which we consider to be Brahma but now when I'm looking at the word Brahma B-R-A-H-M-A and then if I take the A from the end of the Brahma and I put it at the beginning I get Abraham hmm. so now for me that is exciting Ki, aray, there could be a possible overlap between Abraham and Brahma. Then I think to myself, nahi, nahi, Ashwin, tum pagalo. this mm. cannot be a connection. Mm. But then I think to myself that no, Brahma's consort is always Saraswati. And who is Abraham's wife in the Old Testament? Sarah. Sarah Saraswati. Oh, so wow. now I'm wondering, no, can, this seems too much of a coincidence. Mm. Then I'm looking at, I'm looking at, let us say, the trinities of Hinduism. The female trinity, male trinity. Hmm. Lakshmi Saraswati Kali, Brahma Vishnu Mahesh. And in, you know, in uh, Sanatan Dharma, hmm. we've always had the Sri Yantra, which is basically your overlapping triangles. Hmm. The intersection between Shiva and Shakti. So I say, okay, fine. Let's not have nine triangles, mm. just two triangles. One representing male, one representing female. Overlap them. What do you get? A six-pointed star. Where else do you see the six-pointed star? The star of David. David. Right? So where is the connection from 
from our uh, uh, from our male female trinity to the star of david then i think no no this couldn't be i go down south i see not only the om i see the swastik but i also see the six pointed star at the temples and i'm wondering where else have i seen it and then i'm looking through a coffee table book mm. and i see a sketch that sketch is a 15th century sketch which is of a tomb in afghanistan drawn by an english lieutenant and i'm looking at that and i say my god the doors outside that tomb right it's an islamic tomb mm. that sketch is drawn in ghaznavi it is the tomb of mohammad ghazni Hmm. and the doors to that tomb have six pointed stars which is not an islamic symbol but how much of it is easy one minute yeah. one minute I, you, the, the the finality of this yes the six pointed star is on that door so you're wondering why is that six pointed star on the door hmm. and then you dig a little deeper and you realize that when mohammad ghazni attacked somnath he carried away the sandalwood doors correct and those sandalwood doors were then installed outside his tomb so now you find that connection as to why it's there so for me it is never about one particular thing that will excite me you find me. the links it will be the linkages between those things that will excite me but how me. easy it is to take you, you know you can know these links how much of it can you put in literature the liberty that you take do you, do you would you agree that you can take it perhaps with your writings on hinduism than other religions that it will you know that you can perhaps get away or people will encourage or people will be more than happy to read your books if you're taking and making a link in in your books that has hinduism in it compared to other religions no it's not that because after all when i started out writing the rosabal line yes uh, the rosabal line was not a book that i planned to write mm. uh, you know people think that we as writers go out looking for stories actually stories come looking for us so that was a story that came looking for me uh, and uh, uh, in the heart of shrinagar there is a there is a, a grave there is a uh, tomb that tomb has stood there from roughly 112 ad mm. so 2000 years old and uh, uh, ostensibly the person buried there puja is a, a, a muslim peer by the name of nasiruddin that is a 13th 14th century burial mm. but what is fascinating about that tomb is that beneath the body of nasiruddin there is an earlier burial mm. and that is not in an islamic direction which is north south it is in an east west direction which used to be the direction of an ancient jewish burial mm. and outside the tomb there is a carving which shows a pair of human feet and those human feet uh, have little cross marks on them which are indications of where the nails for a crucifixion would have been hammered mm. so it is commonly believed that isa masi came there and settled down now the mere fact that i am writing about that mm. then raises a question on the resurrection yes. so the point is that if you say that there is a possibility that i could only be writing about hinduism mm. that's not true mm. so i end up getting bashed from all sides you do do you get yeah so that how, but, how difficult is it when you want to write the sort of writings you did because i know in my experience that uh even a sort of liberal ecosystem will encourage you more perhaps if you're willing to criticize uh, the caste discrimination in hinduism but if you talk about other religions then oh, absolutely if you criticize the caste system then you 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 get sort of somewhat in it it turns the yeah absolutely yes. but if you try and do the same thing with let's say religion then probably the the, the outcome will be you're, slightly you're, different you sophisticatedly sidelined sometimes but you have managed to bring on all religions in in today's time when there's so much talk about secularism writing on religion everyone seems to be writing on religion is there an uh, or when i say everyone is in a lot of india narrative so to say is coming about is there an overload of the sort of writings that are coming in on indian narrative or hindu narrative or is it an overcompensating of perhaps not being written about much in the past how do you see the trend that see, is there see if you writings? really i i started writing in 2005 and i published my first novel in 2008 hmm. but I am probably one of the most rejected novelists mm. with 47 literary agents and publishers having said thank you but no thank you 47 rejections 47 now the point is why the reason is that the publishing industry was not ready 
for the sort of stories that I wanted to tell. Hmm. Uh, and I think that that has been a fundamental problem. It's only in the last, I would say, decade or so that Indian writing is the writing that tends to dominate the bestseller lists. Hmm. If you remember going into bookstores 15 years ago, you would realize that it was the usual suspects, the Dan Browns and the Jeffrey Archers and the Frederick Forsyths, which were right there on the top of the mm. bestseller charts. So I think there has been a change where, and I think my, my dear friend, probably Chetan Bhagat, mm. has a lot to do with it because that change which happened yes, okay. in terms of suddenly realizing Indian that you writing. can have Indian writing which sells in lakhs, mm. that was an unheard of phenomenon. You always had the Surendra Mohan Pathaks mm. who sold in lakhs, mm. but you didn't have English writers mm. who sold in those numbers. So I think that change has undoubtedly happened. Let's talk about one of your books, Chanakya Chant, because that's one of the most popular people are writing. Chanakya Chant is about Chanakya's philosophy and how it is in the modern times and can it be repeated? And we, we see that human nature hasn't evolved much. So how has that book been to you? Do you, do you believe that today's politics uh, is similar to how it would have been during Chanakya's time. And if I can ask you, do you think there is a politician today or has been in the past in the country who has a Chanakya mind or who has a Chanakya-like advisor with oh, him? There are so her? many. But coming back to your question about politics, what is politics? Politics is simply war without bloodshed. Hmm. So, and the nat that nature of politics has never changed. We wistfully talk about the so-called good old days. Uh, you know, Chanakya chant would not have been thought of or visualized had it not been for the 2009 elections mm. where I was sitting at Delhi airport uh, and watching the news channels where they were attempting to form a cabinet after UPA2. Mm. And uh, Mr. Karuna Nidhi had come from Chennai to Delhi and he was attempting uh, and then gone away in a huff mm. uh, because he didn't get the sort of cabinet positions that he wanted. And I was thinking to myself, I said, it's been several weeks since the election results and we still don't have a government. Was politics always this messy? And when we say good old days, were they really good? Hmm. And the realization I had was that the only thing that has changed is the means. Today we can bring down governments through elections. Hmm. We, can, we can buy out governments through Clearly. various other means. Hmm. But at the end of the day, it's not as if we... Hathi, Ghode, or Rath Leke Nikalte hai to settle a political dispute. So that is the nature that has changed. But was it always as bad? Yes. I mean, if you take just the word politics, poly in Greek means many. Politic, huh? And ticks are blood sucking creatures. So the very nature of politics has not changed. Many people would agree. Many netas are sucking blood literally and metaphorically. So that has not changed and it never will. It won't? It won't. Okay, very interesting. Okay, let's talk about, before we come to your most recent book, The Magicians of Mazda, which is about the Zoroastrian philosophy, I do want to ask about the writings that you've had. I noticed that a lot of your writings talk about how uh, within, within the Hinduism, there is inherent secularism that's seen, and that's what makes India that it is, which we don't see it in our neighbors like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan. Why do you say that? Why do you think it stands even today? Should it stand? Is it changing? Are people becoming slightly more restrictive in their thinking? You see, there has been always a fundamental dichotomy between Dharmic and Abrahamic. Hmm, that's true. So if you st look at Abrahamic, there is only one true way, whereas that has never been the essence of Dharmic thought. Dharmic thought has been that there are multiple truths. And that is the reason why uh, you can have, uh, for example, in, within the world of Dharmic thought, uh, you could say that the means to enlightenment is through Yantra or Tantra or Mantra, but all of them are okay. You could say that I worship Shiva, you worship Shakti, that's also fine. I look at a stone and I call it a shivling, you look at the shivling and call it a stone. Both of us are correct in our own ways. And we can thrive together. And we can, we can still accept that you have an alternative point of view. Mm. We can have 300 versions of the same epic known as the Ramayana, but your version does not negate my version. Mm. That is the essence of liberalism. So Sanatan Dharma has always had that inbuilt liberalism. The, the dichotomy that we have today, the sort of discourse that is happening, the worry that I have in my mind is that undoubtedly 
over a period of time, Abrahamic thought has to become far more dharmic in the sense that it has to become inherently more liberal. But my worry is that we should not have a situation where dharmic thought becomes inherently more Abrahamic. Do you think that's happening and why? It can happen. Hmm. So th this is a very, very fine line that we that's need to walk in order to make sure that we occupy the middle ground. Well, that's, that's a very interesting thought. Let's talk about, I want you to listen to this carefully, of how you meet someone, you have a conversation with, let's say, some great writer or filmmaker or anyone from your, from your field or otherwise, and it can change the course of your life, the course of your literature. Da Vinci Code, I don't know how many of you have read it, it's a popular book, it's been made into big series. Dan Brown had a conversation with you, you meet him, and you go slightly away from your usual writing and you make The Magicians of Mazda, which is about Parsis, Zoroastrians. How did you meet Dan Brown? Why were you interested in meeting him? How did Dan Brown get interested in the Parsis? How did you start to write a book on that? So, I feel that the story might go from... So, I'll try and give you the summarized version of it. Yes. Uh, so, in 2015 or 14, Dan Brown was delivering a lecture in Bombay and his publishers reached out to me and, and they said that, Ashwin, will you do what Pooja is doing? In hmm. other words, will you have a conversation on stage with okay. Dan? Okay. Uh, and moderate that conversation, which I did. Uh, there were about 1,100 people that night at the NCPA. We finished the conversation uh, of about an hour or so. And then he said, okay, let's go uh, and have dinner. Uh, so we went and had dinner, and uh, we, were, we were chatting almost till about 1.30 or 2 in the morning. Hmm. Um, and during, the, uh, during that conversation, he asked me, uh, and by then, m mind you, both of us were well lubricated with, uh, with whiskey, but uh, uh, he asked, what is your definition of God? Hmm. And uh, I said, uh, I took a napkin and on that with a pen I wrote, G is equal to infinity minus K. Hmm. So he asked, what does this mean? I said, well, you consider G is what we consider divine, hmm. God. Infinity is the entire universe, the Brahman. Hmm. It is not only the universe that exists, but the multiple universes that we don't know about, as well as the multiple universes that have either existed or will exist. Mm. It's everything. And K is the extent of human knowledge, which is not even a drop in the ocean. So anything that we don't know, we attribute to God. Mm. The Egyptians saw the sun rise in the east, set in the west. Mm. They thought that it was a ch the, the, the sun god... Drove, drove across the skies in his chariot. When he went to sleep at night, it, be, uh, it mm. became dark. So then suddenly, Galileo, Copernicus, Aryabhatta, and everyone came along and said, no, 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 this is a giant ball of fire. Yes. And as a result of which, poor Ra lost his divine status because now you could explain it. Mm. But what is very interesting about that equation of G equal to infinity minus K mm. is the fact that whenever you have infinity on one side of an equation the equation becomes indeterminate. So in that sense, God is indeterminate. So You can't explain it. When you start talking about the Parsi community, I understand they, they may be very visible in Mumbai and Maharashtra, but they are also, they can be very restrained because of their reducing numbers. Yeah. You went to the Tower of Silence. You were not even allowed yeah. to enter. How did you manage to write something on so the, the Parsis? Next, the next day, Dan Brown tells me, he said, I have a few hours, take me to the Tower of Silence. Mm. Take me to some exciting place. Mm. So I first thought that I'll take him to the lodge uh, he said, no, I don't want to go to the, the Mason's Lodge. Then I said, okay, fine, I'll take you to St. Thomas's Cathedral, the first church. No, I don't want to go there. So I said, okay, fine, then leave it on me. And we landed up at the Tower of Silence. And of course, you can only go up to a certain point in Dungarwadi hmm. as non-Parsis. So we landed up there, and then there was a kind priest who took us through the model of Dungarwadi, showed us how it operates. Hmm. And I could see the glint in Dan Brown's eyes that, there's something that there is something like this hmm. which exists. And that's the moment I realized that, no, this is a story which actually requires a book devoted to it. To it. Uh, and as it turns out, a year later, I was on a flight from Delhi to Bombay and Baman Irani was uh, sitting next to me. Actor Baman Irani? Yeah. Okay. And we got talking about the Parsis and the Bawa community. 
and he said uh, listen why don't you read kissai sanjan okay. which is the first per- the which is the narrative of the arrival of the parsis in 720 ce hmm. which is what i read hmm. and then that's the moment i said no i need to research this is it also inspired by the covid era the vaccines so undoubtedly because uh, the the hero of the story the protagonist is a guy called jim dastur hmm. who has discovered this miraculous cure which could take care of a lot of ailments uh, but he specifically does not want it to be patented hmm. because he wants it to be available a to the widest good. a public good hmm. uh, which at that point of time i could see all the news going on around me as to the games that the vaccine companies were playing so lot of money being yeah. given here and there yes but so it has iran india covid era the vaccines that were made and how the politics around it lovely before we toss it open to some of you you have a best selling author in front of you ask what you want but i do have a question on on the tips that you can give to our viewers i see a lot of young people there is anyone interested in writing a book becoming a writer or there are few okay okay, okay. There are okay. some youngsters who do want to write a book. You know, can you give some tips to people who and okay. what should you do if you want to write a best-selling book? I would say probably Three. five things. Okay, five. Five. Uh, five is a good number. Okay, fair. You enough. had five Pandavas. <laughs> you have Panchamrit. Uh, you know, ev- ev- everything is in fives. Lovely. So, five pot. Uh, five little tips. Number Notes. one. Number one. uh too many people think about writing but they don't write get into the habit of writing something it could be one paragraph a day it could be a facebook post but get into the habit of writing something every day uh number 2 i would say don't uh, worry about what people will think about your writing uh i have always maintained that it's the writer's job to write and the critic's job to criticize so there will always be a uh, professional as well as unprofessional critics that's the nature of the creative world so don't worry about what people are going to think that's about good. your writing i would say the third thing is that be inspired there is no harm in being inspired you like someone's writing that's fine but eventually work towards finding your own voice the space that you are most comfortable with the you know i i have always believed that the job of a writer is to make familiar things sound new or to make new things sound familiar it's one of mm. the two so find what you want to really talk about and that you will suddenly find that the words are flowing fourth don't lose the day job it's very difficult very to important. write when you are hungry so keep the income flowing because that's very very important writers can write books faster than publishers write checks it's going to be a long long time before royalties start flowing in and number 5 if you do attain a modicum of success look back at every page and be grateful for every word on the page to ma saraswati because those words are not yours they came from somewhere else stay humble stay, stay humble. grounded i think these are very important tips paisa milta hai writing se do you get paid enough if i want to become a writer can i you know is there i know it's a lonely think, job but at least if there's money see first of all it it in the old days it used to be almost impossible to use writing as a as a paying profession mm. most people were also writers mm. so they were journalists but also a writer they were uh, movie makers and also a writer they were in the advertising industry and also writing so it writing in and of itself could not make money that has thankfully changed over the last decade or so as a result of which but un- unfortunately again you need to be in that top 5% hmm. to be able to make your writing and checks that takes time. and that takes time hmm. and very often it doesn't even happen hmm. i have always maintained that you know i go to a lot of these lectures where kids ask me you know what you you talk about luck what is what is the guy who is lucky hmm. i said well if you are lucky then you get to do what you love hmm. if you are a little luckier then you get to do what you love and you are also good at it hmm. but if you are really lucky then you get to do what you love you are also good at it and someone's willing to pay you for it yeah. but unfortunately that third stage happens to very few so keep at it that's the most important take away consistency. consistency consistency is the key to writing let's take two three questions quickly all right in the front row chandni go ahead hello yeah. ashwin 
Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, you, yes, of okay. course. The uh, two books on your bedside table right now. Somebody else, what are you reading right now? Oh, um, actually, I have been at this point of time in the process of uh, researching for my next book. So, unfortunately, Chandni, what I end up reading is to a very great extent dictated by what I happen to be writing next. Uh, so the, the number of times when I only read on account of me, that is what I want to read, uh, unfortunately is few and far between. It's normally between books. So right now, for example, if you look at my stack of books, it's a big stack of books, but it's all related to a particular time, time a particular era of about roughly 200 odd years, which I'm currently researching. Uh, but if you ask me what are the sort of books that I like reading, one of the books which is permanently on my bedside, irrespective, is a book called The Autobiography of a Yogi uh, hmm. by Paramahans Yoganand. And that was a book which I read when I was probably 12 or 13. And then I've ended up reading it multiple times, probably 10 or 20 times. Uh, does and it change every, when you read a book much later as an adult? Is there a different course perspective? Course it does. Same of course book? it does. Of course it does. Um, my, my, uh, my maternal grand uncle used to send me a book every week to read. Mm. Uh, and uh, he sent that to me at a time when he thought that, I mean, he had far greater expectations of me. So he imagined that even as a 12 or a 13 year old, I could actually read and absorb it. Mm. And most of it went over my head. But then when I visited the book again at age 15, I could pick up far more. Mm. And now when I read it, I say, why didn't I think of that? See, I've always maintained that in what I do as a writer, my job is the three E's. What are those three E's? The first is to entertain. If I can't entertain you, I'll not get you to turn the page. 70% of what I do is to entertain. 20% is to educate. Maybe there'll be some material that you will come across in a Bharat series book that you've not read before. And you'll say, oh, I didn't know I this. I didn't know about this. Huh? And third, by the time you reach the end of the book, hmm. hopefully you should have that bhatti on moment hmm. where suddenly you say, why didn't I think of this hmm. issue the way that he has? And that is, I consider, the moment of enlightenment. So it's a 70, 20, 10 rule. Again, good advice. One, one, sorry, uh, yes. Ashwin, you have to enlighten us. <laughs> Amish... Devdat or Ashwin Sanghi? I must tell you, I am, whether it is Ashok Banker, whether it is Devdat, whether it is Amish, honestly speaking, I think they do a far better job with whatever they write than I do because frankly, you know, there was that old Beatles song that I'm just a paperback writer. There was a paperback writer. Uh, it's a lonely story leading a lonely life. Uh, and he's wondering as to when his ne next paycheck will come in. So Ashwin Sanghi is that paperback writer. I don't claim to be anything more. Whereas these people are people who have actually studied the scriptures. They've actually tried to make sense of, the, uh, of, of our ancient texts. Are you texts. friends? Do you fight with each other? Are there oh, differences? We are very good friends. All, all of, of us. Yeah. All of us. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. No disagreements in each other's writings? We all have disagreements. Yeah? Big time. So... Put me and Devdat in a room, we are 180 degrees. But the point is that we can still be friends. And that's what I, what I, what I love, that I should be able to disagree with you while continuing to be agreeable. I think that art of discourse is something that we are losing along the way. It's, it's very important. Absolutely. Very important. I agree. We'll take one or two more questions, then we'll wrap up. Go ahead. Bye. Uh, hello, sir. A big fan. Uh, I belong to Gujarat as well. So Hi. my question is uh, related to the book, pertains to the book, that uh, Parsis, uh, they opted for Div, uh, a place Dew. in Gujarat, uh, for the original part. They stayed there for roughly 18, 19 years. That's right. But then they opted for Nausari. So based on your research, what do you feel? Why was the shift and transition? Why was Nausari more welcoming for okay. the Parsis as a community? Actually, when they ran from Hormuz, the island of Hormuz is where they ran from. And then they, the, the first point that they encountered, encountered was due. Now, uh, uh, remember one thing, all of this coastline was very familiar to the Zoroastrians. I mean, if you read the Mahabharat, there is reference to something known as the Parasikas. Actually, it's the ancient word for Parsis, Paras, Paras. So 
even the Mahabharat refers to those who lived to the west of the Sindhu as the Parasikas. So these were ancient mariners and they were already familiar with the entire Gujarat coast. So they arrived in Diu and they settled down there for about roughly 18 odd years. But you know, they used to depend a lot on the prophecies of the Dastur's, their high priests. And after 18 years, the high priest told them that it is not worthwhile for us to continue to be here. We need to move on. The, the stars are foretelling that we need to move to another place. And that is how they ended up trying to cross from Dew into Gujarat. And along the way, there was a major storm. And as a result of that storm, they prayed to their god, Ahura Mazda. And they said that if we make landfall, then we will find a way to consecrate a fire wherever we land. And as it turns out, they landed up in Sanjan. And the Raja, of course, of Sanjan was someone called Jadi Rana. And Jadi Rana was not too keen on the idea of a bunch of new people, 18,000 people, landing up out there. And then everyone knows the story of, uh, of, them, uh, of him giving uh, them a bowl of milk, which was completely full, and them adding a little yeah. sugar into it, saying that we will only sweeten uh, the... And then when Jadi Rana thought about it, he said that, why am I actually worried about these people? I mean, if I really think about it, Varuna and Mitra are worshipped in the Rig Ved, and they are also worshipped in the uh, Avesta. Uh, the cow is held sacred. I mean, I, I didn't know how sacred the cow was in Zoroastrianism until I ended up doing research that it is held as sacred uh, uh, to the Zoroastrians as it is there, there uh, are to the Hindus. There are quite a few similarities between Absolutely. Hindu religion and Zoroastrians. How so whether is it is... If I answer that question, Pooja, then you will not buy the book. So I'm not going to answer Fair that enough. because Fair the enough. one thing that Ashwin is, is not only a writer, but also a marketer. Sure so I want people to buy the book. Today. Absolutely. <laughs> but, okay. Sir, tell me, there's a lot of people in the blue shirt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was a simple question that why why do we see that the Indian writers are not being able to uh, uh, make uh, you know global you know trends you know uh, as far as global market is concerned you know as far as writing is concerned you uh, gave the example of Dan Brown but why can't we produce Indian Dan Brown who can go global and pick up some kind of scale so and it's a damn good question mm -hmm. it's a damn damn good question uh, I genuinely believe that unfortunately what has happened is the publishing ecosystem in the West is used to writers from India only producing award-winning work. In other words, for the longest time, even in India, in India, a publishing industry was primarily offshoots of the Western publishing houses. The big publishing houses had their offshoots here in India. And uh, for the longest time, it was taken for granted that if you were a writer from India, then either you were meant to be writing a family saga Poverty. Or you were meant to do some sort of slump porn, as it were. Or otherwise, you were expected to write a how-to book on how to make a good biryani. I mean, so those were the classes of books that you wrote. Um, the ones who broke out from that were the ones who uh, were writing literary fiction. So whether it was the Salman Rushdies of the world or the Arundhatis of the world, those were the ones who then began to be appreciated as a result of which what happened was that every publisher was looking out for the next, the next Rushdie or the next Arvinda Diga or what, what have you. As a result of which commercial fiction writing never took off in our country. It was always there in Hindi. You always had the pulp crime thrillers of the Surendra Mohan Pathaks selling in lakhs. But English fiction, which was commercial is fiction that writing... Is now? Should that and change? And that is... It's only the last 10 or 12 years so where that has awareness. changed. And you know the funny thing? The one who had really tried to change this was probably Satyajit Ray way back in the 1950s and 60s with Feluda. And unfortunately, we did not give him his due. Hmm. We never made that series popular. So I think that has only changed in the last one decade. So give it another decade, sir. 
give it one more decade one, one hopefully last question from the hopefully young i will make you proud by seeing up. ashwin sanghi books on the international book stands okay. i will try ek ek wo uh, go ahead uh, if one more question together we can take then he can answer bata hi uh, so it's a great to hearing you so my question from you is uh, that when Mike you were, karo, when you were start your career that time maybe you also uh, maybe some people also criticize your writing so when someone criticize the writers then they can uh, lose their confidence at that time so how can we overcome with this problem very good question okay. she is a young writer i Great. do you want to become a writer do you want to write but are you scared of the trolling and the criticism so when when i was when i had just r- finished writing the rosabal line and i had started sending out my manuscript a lot of very nasty feedback would come back and you know on a board in front of my desk i had some numbers written in front of me and people used to come into my study and wonder what those numbers were the numbers were 12 and 28 and 30 and 33 and 38 uh and later on i explained that 12 was the number of times that jk rowling's first harry potter book was rejected and uh uh 28 was the number of times that uh the great work uh, jonathan livingston seagal was rejected 30 was the number of times that stephen king's carry was rejected 33 was the number of times that chicken soup for the soul was rejected uh so i i used to always say that hey listen now you're getting close to that final figure and by the time that my score came at 47 i was very proud of myself that i've beaten the pants of jk rowling So the point is, How you need you to. How do you write after forty-seven you need rejections? To, Didn't you think, "Yeah, chodo, I can't write. Maybe I'm not a good writer." To answer your question in particular, uh, is that you need to figure out a way of being able to give a positive spin to whatever is going on around you. When I wrote the Rosabal line, it was a book which was appreciated tremendously by the critics. Yes. One of the very respected newspapers of the South wrote a glowing review. They said we do a great disservice to Ashwin Sanghi by comparing him to Dan Brown because Ashwin Sanghi is so much more. And I was damn proud of myself. <laughs> But the Rosabal line didn't sell many books. On the other hand, the second book came out, Chanakya's Chant. The very same newspaper wrote a half-page review. completely trashing the book they said ashwin sanghi and his book have the intellectual caliber of winnie the pooh so and that book took off it's one of your most popular and it became the most popular in so please remember the critics job is to find holes in your plot in your story in your writing but the ultimate critic is your reader The Are you scared of controversy, Ashwin? Uh, because or today a lot of them want controversy. It, it helps them sell more. But you don't have a controversy given you write so much. Controversies, puja, controversies do not happen. They are created. It is a very conscious decision when someone decides to create a controversy so that his book or movie can sell. if you decide that you are writing a topic out of a genuine interest in that topic and you are approaching that topic with a sense of awe and respect you can't automatically end up with a controversy unless you want it is that all the time we have for because i would love for this conversation to continue but we i you have a question lovely we have uh, two more questions ab saath mein pooch lijiye yeah. two more two three more questions we, we could take, take. yeah yes, lovely Go, uh, Nabila, you want to ask something? I I basically wanted to ask on behalf of myself also, and a lot of the youngsters I see here. You know, we we barely have any focus or attention in today's di- digital That's age, right? Point, yes. To read a whole book, uh, you want to sift through. That's more or less our attitude. And now you have apps that help you take out excerpts, excerpts from a br- uh, from a book. But is it possible? to do that with books uh, of indian authors because you you are so in depth and detail can you really you know surface level skim stuff no i i i don't think that is possible but there are uh, other alternatives like mm. for example you could convert for example a book into let's say hypothetically a video game uh, and so an essence of that product could emerge as a result of you being able to absorb it in a very different format mm. or for example ott has suddenly resulted in a spurt of books getting converted into the visual medium mm. but yes what you said is 
spot on that attention spans have declined yeah uh, you see uh, news going viral with a one minute clip right yeah. we we struggle to do news we, condensed yeah. in one minute can can a so, ashwin sangvi's book be condensed to you, multiple one minutes if you read the rosabal line or chanakya's chant the average chapter was about roughly 3000 words hmm. if you read any of my later books they are all under a thousand words so that reflects the declining attention span quickly right. two questions <laughs> then yes am i audible yeah good afternoon sir Hi. sir i am a newbie writer and okay. as a newbie writer i have a question welcome to the club thank you sir as a newbie writer i have a question that pops up you know all the time in my mind and i am working on my first book and i think that whether i should write from the perspective of the reader or should i write on the basis of what i want the reader to know So I am completely confused between these two perspectives. Can you can that other person that. in the pink turban also ask? Yes, he's been uh, the one in front. Ek saath fir then you can. Good afternoon, sir. It's a afternoon. big fan. Thank sir, you. is there any chance that we get a Sikhism book too? Oh, lovely! <laughs> That's a good okay. question. Okay. Uh, so to answer the first sir. question, I I I would say that honestly speaking, the the way at least I like to think about what you should write about. is not about necessarily what your reader wants to read not necessarily what you know about it should be what you would like to know about because if there you, is a as the writer would like to know about what you would like to know about as a writer because that is then a topic that you will want to find out everything about as a result of which it will not feel like work most of the topics that i have written about are topics that i have evaluated for 2 3 4 months before i have eventually started writing because i wanted to make sure that that is a topic that i can be interested in for the next 2 years it takes me 2 years to craft a book in the bharat series so i have to live with that topic for the next 2 years so i think that's very important don't worry too much about what is in fashion because fashions come and go you know this whole world this whole world for example of campus romance became very very famous because of chetan bhagat <laughs> today very few are really reading campus romances in fact even chetan has moved on to crime thrillers north south romance <laughs> similarly today for example if you consider the world of mythology because so many of us came into this space that we just generally call mythology but now what you have is a bunch of people and you'll see that within 5 years there will be a fatigue factor with this also <laughs> so don't worry about the trend that is in unimportant if i had worried about the trend i would never have written the rosabal line in 2005 to 2007 because there was no chance of getting it published instead of writing something which was the trend i ended up creating a trend try and be that and what about sikhism the one religion you missed till now in our nagarjuna yeah so so no i i i i think this is something which has been on the back burner for a very very long yeah, time yeah you've been planning to it has been you know in my case what happens is that uh whenever there are ideas uh the one uh, i maintain a journal and that journal is in the form of a email data bank what does that mean this is journal when you have you you think of something you write it down so i will Weekly like right now it. you and i are in conversation there is maybe two things that you said that are interesting to me so when i get into my car i will email it. myself that these are these are certain things that you said hmm. which then later on become sort of the batti on moments for me so undoubtedly a book which uh, uh, traces the evolution of sikhism as well as the uh, relevance that it has okay. had the you know we will be surprised the extent to which it has had a socio political influence hmm. on our country that is something which I has i think you write any books you've written for too long now and it will continue to be best sellers today's session was a treasure i promise you it will happen and one day Ashwin, I but will go the and only thing i can tell you is that it it will definitely happen what i can't promise you is when it will happen that we'll wait for that i'll go rewatch this session so many notes for me to also jot down thank you so much i think what you're doing ashwin is so revolutionary in so many ways of your writing please stay at it all the very best to you thank you so thank much thank you to all of you